Hey guys, I love people who are not just about one thing, personalities who have many different sides to them. And today my guest is Luca Pozzi. He is a highly accomplished data scientist. He has a PhD from Berkeley. He worked at Facebook, Uber, Cruise Automation, Airbnb. And at the same time, he is a passionate marathon swimmer. He has done swims that you don't even consider possible. Do you want to learn more about data science? This world runs on data. At the end of this video, Luca mentions a great book about data science for the normal guy. Please comment down below for the first commenter whose comment gets at least 10 likes. I'm sending this book for free. Let's go for Luca. Guys, I'm super excited to announce that today with us is Luca Pozzi, uh, a data scientist from Silicon Valley. Luca, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm excited good. to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, Luca, um, first things first, what's the maximum amount you ever swam? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. In one, in one sitting, uh, 28 miles. And that was uh, this swim all around Manhattan Island in New York. It's called uh, the 20 Bridges, because, of course, okay. you go under the 20 Bridges uh, that connect uh, Manhattan Island to, you know, New Jersey, New York, uh, and all of that. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the longest in terms of time is uh, 10 and a half hours um, across Lake Tahoe from uh, south to north. So 28 miles, to be clear, that's like 40 kilometers for in European right. measures, right? Probably even slightly more, like 45 maybe. And Something like that, you, yeah. you did that without ever pausing. Yeah, so you stop every 30 minutes to feed. They throw you something from the, you always have a, a pile of both with you, both like okay. for safety and for like carrying your, your nutrition. And so mm -hmm. basically every 30 minutes, they throw you something like, you know, like, like you would with a seal, you do, you do a little trick uh, and uh, grab the food. Uh, you, you cannot touch the boat. The boat cannot touch you. You just drink and go. So okay. um, it kind of breaks it. It also breaks it up and, you know, um, instead of 10 hours, 20 short 30 minutes uh, spans. And then you just take a rest? Uh, yeah, I mean, you cannot, you cannot hold on to the boat, so you cannot really rest and, you know, your clock is ticking. But if you want, I mean, you can crack a joke with the people on the boat, you know, take a bit longer to, to drink and, uh, you know, take your time uh, as, you, as you prefer, let's say. People watching this video will be thinking like, what are they talking about? He said he's a data scientist and now they're talking about swimming. Now that's Luca. All right. Tell me about a couple of your swims, like the most exciting ones or the most unusual ones. So you probably hold a couple of records. Uh, tell me about that. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's a great question because, uh, right. I mean, without the, without the background, that's a pretty sharp tangent from the science and I'm sure we'll get back there at some point, but oh, yeah. uh, so this is like what I do when I'm not in front of a computer. It's like basically ultra marathon swimming or channel swimming is, uh, basically like swimming across some sizable body of water wearing just, you know, cap goggles, a, a normal swimsuit. And, uh, like, I think that, uh, as you were saying, like, exciting ones i think that the the most the one that got me the most excited was this swim i did in japan between mm -hmm. uh, honshu is the main island the one with tokyo and hokkaido is like the, the northmost island where people you know sometimes go uh, uh, skiing or and there is this uh, little channel between the two is called the sugaru channel mm -hmm. uh, and that was really fun because you know it was 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 really interesting trip you you go up there like it's very far from tokyo there is, you're basically the only guy Jin there. Everyone else is like from the place. And you're okay. in these little towns where there's literally no like really small little towns. And you, they ask you like in the street, like uh, you swim. It's like, yeah, because otherwise you would not be there, right? They don't <laughs> see many foreigners. <laughs> uh, and that was really, really beautiful. Like uh, you, you jump at night and you swim over the night and at night you you see um they have a light on you just you know not to lose you in the darkness and you see flying fish you see squids 
like I saw this pack of squids going under me was uh, was really exciting. And then of course, you know, the food is great and uh, you, you get to, you know, have a pretty nice trip after. So <laughs> that was uh, my favorite so far. <laughs> All right, I think our viewers uh, deserve a little explanation at this point. So Luca Pozzi here, he's a very accomplished data scientist, but he's also an avid swimmer, okay? And because I have people who are well-versed in different things uh, on my show, I like to show like not only the professional and business side of people, but also their personal people. This show is all about normal guys, okay? I'm showing people that it doesn't take an Elon Musk to be successful and to do cool stuff in life, right? I mean, Elon is a great guy, but I mean, everybody knows about him and not many people know about millions and tens of millions of other people who accomplished something very good. So I try to, you know, to demonstrate that people are very interesting that they are different and they have different exciting sides to them. So back to swimming, how much of a preparation does such a thing take? I mean, do you have to be a lifelong swimmer? Like I swim normally, I can probably swim a kilometer, probably two kilometers if I stretch myself. How much, I mean, would I be able with preparation to do a swim like that? That's a great question. So I, I am a lifelong swimmer. I mean, like my, my parents actually met uh, in their swim team. So I'm kind of like, you know, I had no choice grow, growing up. I, I, I have swum since, since I can remember. Like I'm not, okay. for, but it, it, I love this sport because it's not about that. Like, of course there are people like, you know, like me has swum like their whole life. There is even people that like swim very competitively, you know, trial time and that kind of stuff. But then you have people that like started in their adult years. You have even like a lot of older people. Like I know like uh, I, one of my good friends, he's going to try to be the oldest guy to swim the channel. Like he already swam it like a few years ago, but he wants to do it when he turns, I don't know, 75 or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you have people that like maybe just started swimming a few years ago and uh, it, it's commendable because it, it's a completely different sport, right? I mean, for me, I can leverage the speed and maybe be a little bit re less resistant with the cold. Maybe other people, they're resistant with the cold, but it takes them twice as long as it takes me. So right. it's, it's really inspiring to see that everyone brings their own strategy to it. Um, mm -hmm. There is a very good uh, documentary. It was on Netflix a while ago, and it's actually one of my friends, so like one of, uh, like this woman that swims like in my club, and she had this very bad accident, almost lost her leg, like in a bad fall. And they told her like you'll never walk again, and she was very stubborn and like started swimming, and then became like one of the most accomplished women in like in swimming because she did swim this like Ocean Seven. There are like seven channels all across the world like this japan japanese one is one of those but like she you know and then she swam from this uh, uh Fraulein island which is like 30 miles off the coast of san francisco shark infested water like she became this star but she was never like a, a competitive swimmer growing up so it's, it's really right. inspiring to people you know from all types of uh background right so so basically a person that wasn't swimming from when they were two uh yeah. can still do one of those crazy swims that yeah. you've done yeah totally totally how many years just about, i mean uh, if, yeah, if, in, uh, if, I, if i want to do that how, how much time it will take me a couple I of years say, i mean a couple of years yeah i would say a couple of years you know you kind of like first go like into like a 5k maybe a 10k and then a 10 miles and then you know 20 miles right but uh, it's there is definitely a path there whereas like you know Probably neither of us is ever going to be as fast as Michael Phelps, but right. both of us, we can do these longer things as we prepare, you know, enough. Okay. On your blog, you describe yourself scientist swimmer. Okay. What's <laughs> yes. harder? I mean, these two things are as far as possible, <laughs> as far as it gets from each other, right? So yes. it's, it's funny to compare. You can, okay. Yes, yes. What's harder, scientist or swimmer? Ah, that's a great question. I think it will be harder to be just one of the two, because for me, what what I what I really enjoy is the balance. 
you know, the fact that like I can have a very deep week at work and then, you know, I go out, cold water washes off all my cares and I'm free. Or then like uh, I have been thinking about like this like problem and then I, I jump in the water and I have time to think about it and kind of almost meditate. So um, I really love like how they make each other more feasible, kind of uh, taking, you know, really like balance. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm sure that swimming at such scale is extremely exhausting. It takes a lot of ongoing, you know, being fit all the time and having, you know, to, to keep up with the pace and, and preparing. Uh, how do you balance your busy professional life and your sport life? So basically work life, sport balance. Right, 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 right. I, yeah, yeah. I have to say like, it's, you know, training season is a lot of, uh, uh, like early evenings going to bed early <laughs> instead of, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, sometimes, you know, in the morning it's hard to wake up. You're kind of, you know, tired and, you know, definitely piles up. I have to say that, you know, on one side, I'm lucky because fortunately what I do is very kind of uh, results oriented and it's not really about like punching the clock. It's a very loose on schedule. Like I, I have some of my best friends and their teacher job or like a lawyer job where, you know, they have like much more strict schedule. Yeah. Uh, I am a bit, uh, I, I, I take advantage of the fact that, uh, you know, I, I finish early, I can go for an early swim, you know, in the afternoon and, but um I had to say that like uh, definitely you have those days where you are at work and uh, you're a bit uh, more sleepy or it, it's, it's also good like when, you know, usually offices are open and we get the usual like uh, Silicon Valley free lunch uh, uh, since, you know, I burn a lot of calories. So that that is definitely another <laughs> good perk <laughs> to keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so the lunch perk is even more valuable to you than the average person. Here right, 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 right. Don't let them know because uh, they're gonna like, charge me after the third uh, third serving. <laughs> um, all right, so we're getting closer to your data science to the data science part of you. Okay, what's a data scientist? Tell us, lay that's people. A, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. It's basically everything you want it to be, <laughs> but uh, um, I I saw a few few years ago this uh, this fun uh, quote on uh, uh, Twitter that was like uh, data science is statistics on a Mac, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I liked it because data science data science is something like that we used to call statistics or in some case computer science like back in the days, but it's been kind of rediscovered and retooled to be like both cooler in terms of like uh, kind of branding, but also a bit more modern in terms of approach. And what I mean by data science is everything you want it to be is, is literal. Like, I mean, data science can be, can have many different flavors in the industry because there is so many different uh, personas. And I, I'm gonna get like to, to what I mean by that. Like uh, you can be like a visualization expert of, uh, you know, uh, and do those like crazy good like uh, New York Times uh, visualization uh, graphs that help you, you know, understanding the vaccine rollout or some, um, some other issue. And that's 100% data science. It, but, or you can be like a, like a just uh, like, like I'm personally like a tool builder. So what I really enjoy doing what I really do in most of my, my jobs is uh, building tools for other people to build models, to understand the models they built and these things. And then there is like another persona that is like more on uh, model building. Like I don't build many models in my day-to-day -day job, uh, mm -hmm. but some other people are very much about like building a model and tinkering with it. And um, uh, so I think that data science is really like where like data, data handling and extracting insight from data uh, is. And so of course this creates this ecosystem of roles around it where, okay, uh, maybe you can be the person that builds the tools that that other person uses to mine the data. And so all of this, I think it's uh, like data science. And so basically another very good uh, visualization that I saw back in the days was basically where subject matter knowledge, math and computer science meet, because you kind of need a little bit of each one of them, and then you can be deeper 
in one of the three. So you can be like, okay. uh, for example, I do a lot of like software engineering and maybe in some cases I'm a bit light on the subject matter because I, I care about making a good tool for someone that knows what they're doing. But like other people, like I have colleagues that are like a, a more in the a, a genetics and genomics uh, background and they need like uh, to know so much more about the genetics to even be helpful. And so- okay. You know, they're basically like where math and subject matter knowledge uh, touch. So um, I hope that that makes sense. <laughs> okay. In your blog, you have this phrase drowning in data. And I understand it's a play of words with, with your swimming passion. But like normally, how much data does it take to do data science? And is there such a thing as too much data? Yeah, no, that is... That is an awesome question because yes, there is too much data. Yes, there is not enough data. And I think that like uh, the the way I look at it is big data or like a lot of data does not really um, does not really solve the problem of how you use it. And big data can still have a small data problem. And specifically that quote about drowning in data, I picked it from a, a larger quote that was like, we are drowning, we are thirst, we are drowning in not in we are drowning in data, but we are thirsty for knowledge. Okay. And it's a it's kind of like a play on the fact that sometimes things can be hidden in plain sight and how this data can be like a deafening roar that hides the signal that you care about. And so big data gives you like a tool for asking more and more like specific questions because the more data you have, the more granular you can be. But mm -hmm. even so big data can bleed out pretty quickly, for example, because if you ask mm -hmm. very specific questions, uh, think about, okay, having uh, like data on every citizen in San Francisco, but then asking a very specific question about what you, what you would recommend to a very small population of users. You still have a lot of data that gives you the idea that you could probably ask very specific questions, but you might not have enough data to answer that specific of a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is one issue. The other issue is that big data not necessarily uh, discounts the importance of having the right tooling and the right uh, methodology behind it. So of course you can always like throw data in a model and get something out, but the type of attention that you need to have to what you feed your model doesn't change whether it's big data or, or small data. Of course, you know, big data allows you to be a bit more robust to outliers, a bit more robust to, uh, you know, errors, but still the kind of consideration behind it are the same. And in terms mm -hmm. of like having too little data, yeah, there is definitely such a thing as too little data. Like, uh, unfortunately, like a lot of very important questions like about epidemiology, about like uh, medicine suffer from not having enough data. So they need to make do with uh, very accurate techniques. Uh, and but I think that the, the interesting thing is like when you can actually treat big data as small data and kind of like use this technique to leverage really difficult questions out of data that seems huge. But, you know, this, this, uh, this field show us, you know, uh, the importance of design of experiment, for example, in uh, collecting data to answer very specific questions with not much data. So think about mm -hmm. how much you can leverage the techniques with a lot of data it becomes even more uh, powerful as a tool. I okay. Hope kind of yeah, this it does. Uh, I'm interested in like the hardware side of things. Is there like, is mm -hmm. computer computing power still a limitation? And are there still data science techniques that require more computing power than businesses mm -hmm. can like realistically buy? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, I mean, I was, you know, I, I, I we, we all read from time to time about like uh, quantum computing and how, you know, close we, we, we are. And I don't, I don't know much about that field, but it always makes me think about what would happen if we had unlimited computing power, virtually unlimited computing power. And one of the things like, kind of like brings me back to what I was saying about small data 
approach to big data because there is mm -hmm. you know a separation between like there's a bunch of things that we don't even try with big data because is too hard and too heavy and but like the considerations behind what we can extract from this data are the same as the consideration of what we can extract from smaller data in terms of like what kind of questions we can ask and how careful we need to be with interpretation because just like being able to crunch the data not necessarily gives us good answer but i think that like uh, this is also an exciting time because even like from when i you know i graduated from my college years computing changed completely like the availability of it the fact that i can spin up you know amazon ec cluster and have basically all the computing power i want on demand it's so yeah. like empowering and all these like ai kind of like deep learning methods it's so funny that they were they were basically like a very academic uh, like uh, trinket until we finally had the computers that could run that stuff. And then they, okay. they boomed the discipline. Like all these neural networks existed like for at least like 20, 30 to 20 years, but like we were basically not able to run them if they if not in a very toy problem. And all of a sudden it became feasible and the field exploded. So it's super exciting to see what will happen next. It's hard to predict. But I still suspect that like we will have to be careful with uh, the questions we ask even more as we become empowered to ask more complicated questions. If you if you, if you know what, what I mean. Definitely, definitely. Uh, you worked at Cruise and Uber. Uh, <laughs> the question that I have to ask: Who, in your opinion, will win the autonomous driving battle? Is it like the fence approach by Waymo, for example? I know that they have. I think it's Phoenix, Arizona, where they have these autonomous taxis driving people already. Uh, or is it like real world data gathering by Tesla, which is fed um, so much data and that has this sort of uh, real world verification? What's, what's your take on this? Or is, it, is the world too complex to achieve autonomous driving overall? Uh, yes, I think that is basically like my opinion, and uh, okay. I I think I think you nailed actually the two very very good approaches to the problem, like fencing it, fencing the world, and like uh, uh, reducing it to like a sub problem that is actually exponentially easier to solve. Like driving on the highway, driving on the highway is not that complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be it can be complex for a human that gets tired, gets distracted, but for for a, for a, for a robot where you know you clearly have one degree of freedom, and then you yeah. have very limited uh, interference, it's it's a much simpler problem than like driving in San Francisco with uh, people uh, double parked and uh, like uh, then you get like a pedestrian that is jaywalking, and uh, so and this kind of brings me to. Kind of like also this the current state of machine learning and AI where we can really tackle like a simple problems very well like is this a cat or is this a dog very very simple problem we can nail that very well uh, right. but complex problems where like we have to learn to learn or we like show you know the the, the machine a bunch of examples from different objects that they need to understand how to uh, distinguish now that that is probably like a like a more understood problem but in terms mm -hmm. of like driving in traffic where you have so many different layers and it's it's hard it's hard for us to decompose them in simple tasks mm -hmm. like for example recognizing recognizing traffic cones is something that humans do intuitively and mm -hmm. kind of like uh like know how to interpret them whereas if you need to like teach a machine to do that you need to first Re register yet one more object that they need to learn how to recognize and mm -hmm. then build a series of rules around what to do with that knowledge. So I I don't know if it will, will ever be solved, but for sure, like I see like a very, very promising path to impact in kind of solving the, the subtask that we know to solve first, like, you know, this, uh, the, the downtown of a, of, a, of, a, of a city to become just a robot uh, driving zone. And then you decrease the complexity so that you can actually tackle the problem. 
So that's kind of like my my take on the. So like generally speaking, like taking a step back, uh, you don't think autonomous driving is is gonna happen. Okay, and here is in our I, lifetime. I know, yeah. That, uh, I will not. I will not make uh, declarations that will be used against me because there were maybe tomorrow we 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 have a breakthrough and I look like an idiot. But no. I see it as a very hard problem. Like I, I don't think we have the tools today to solve it. And may, maybe we'll find the tools within our lifetime. I'm kind of like uh, you know, I kind of kind of want to save my safe face, uh, not uh, making statements. But I can uh, delete. I will delete I the video. Some- from YouTube, if we have <laughs> autonomous driving next year, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll hold you. <laughs> like, thank you. <laughs> but but yeah, uh, I f- I find it a very a very much more challenging problem than is some sometimes uh, perceived presented. to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, makes sense. Um, what's your dream data science task? What would you dream of working on? Um. I don't know if I have like a like a dream data science task in terms of like I want to work on that problem, but I do have a series of kind of like personal rules to sniff out stuff that I I would be happy working on. Okay. Uh, because you know, after a while you realize it's almost like dating, right? You realize what are the things that matter for you and the things that don't really matter and kind of like who you can be happy with. And the same, like I realized, you know, in my career about like uh, obs- serving patterns. And so I realized that like intellectually I have big fingers. So I'm not very good at like tinkering with like very precise problems that need to be taken the extra epsilon, you know, beyond what they are. Like, for example, like stuff like Google search. Google search is such right. a like a sophisticated algorithm that has been refined and refined and optimized. And right now, of course, you know, there is still like if you improve it by a, a fraction of a percent is a huge impact. But it's yeah. also not the type of things that I, I, I I'm happy working on. I'm more right. happy on like very kind of groundbreaking tasks, kind of we have nothing. And uh, we got to go from nothing to something, to V0, V1. That's the type of things that I really find exciting. And typically, I try to put myself in a position where I don't know everything about the field. Like, I like to work on new stuff that I, that I don't know much about so that I can, you know, I'm forced to learn and I'm forced to, like, grow. That's the type of things uh, that I, I really like. And then, like, of course, as I was saying, I'm, I'm more of a tool builder. I really... I've really been burnt like during my grad school years on how sometimes people reinvent the wheel over and over again. And I, mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of like dedicated my career to kind of like try to build platforms and make it such that people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So that's right. a very, that's a vague description of what my ideal task is. Your biography is insane. My question is why are you still not a billionaire? Okay. Uh, and what I mean is, do you think, uh, do you believe that markets like stock market, commodity market uh, can be hacked with data science? I mean, like, can you recognize trends and take advantage of markets with data science? Surely this is something many people tend to do, try to do, because this is tempting, okay? Uh, do you think it's possible or yet again, do you think the world is too complex and too unpredictable for this to be, to be feasible? Right. I mean, I mean, surely the world is super complicated, like stock market. There is like so much happening. Like sometimes, you know, it's a, it's almost like buy effect kind of thing. You know, the, the, the head of the Federal Reserve sneezes and uh, the, the stock market goes up and, you know, this kind of things. But I mean, we both know like people that, are pretty successful at that. I mean, I watched an interview with uh, Benoit, Benoit Batayou and he definitely knows, you know, his uh, his data science and his uh, AI, and he's very successful in managing his fund using algorithms. And then, you know, you have these people that work in high fre- frequency trading where they mm-hmm. really predict like very small variations at a very, very high speed. And uh, um, like one of my former bosses uh, started his career in that field. He was telling me that they were like uh, fighting over uh, who was closer to the physically closer to the server so that their, you know, <laughs> their request was getting there <laughs> faster. I mean, I don't know if it's 
tribal tribal superstition was real, but that was the kind of uh, so I do definitely see like very a lot of very promising work in there. Um, I don't know how much you can like make billions out of it, but you you can definitely be successful. It's just something that I never really seriously tried because I I just don't know that much about markets and uh, mm-hmm. uh, but it's definitely something that always intrigued me. It's, it's almost like that kind of uh, holy grail uh, gold rush that uh, eventually I think we all end up trying and some people, you know, strike it rich. <laughs> so. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is sort of like modern day alchemy, right? You turn data yes. In, yes. into gold. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you had a very good description. <laughs> Nice, interesting. Um, I want to go back to your swimming passion and your life on the edge of swimming and data, okay? How can data science be applied to marathons and sports in general? Like, can you optimize for best stamina based on known data about like biological cycles, uh, et cetera? Do you think that, like we discussed like how no one will be able to swim like Michael Phelps, right? Part of this is probably because he's physically right. like ideal to be a swimmer, right? So that's just a question of luck. But can you take advantage of big data in order to be better at sports? Totally, totally, yes. And actually, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, my blog and I, 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 I do try to kind of like blog a little bit about it because some uh, I I like to approach swimming also from kind of like a scientific kind of angle in this in the sense that like there are patterns there are like uh, there is data that you can extract from your from your training that can inform you of what works and what doesn't there is a very very primitive application but even just having a retrospective look at your season and figuring out what went well and what did not go well or if things went well what was different to try to understand what could have caused that like for example i i looked at like year on year my 2019 season with respect to my 2018 or 2017 uh, i was feeling way better sure there is like an experience side but there is also like a switch in some uh, um uh, the, the use of cross training and the the reliance on more open water respect pool that I try to tweak and tune to improve and this is just like me looking at the very meager amount of data that I can extract from my own experience but now mm-hmm. think about like bridging across different athletes or it, doing even more high frequency analytics like uh, there is this um, tool like I think whoop or something is like this bracelet that tells yeah. you, you know, what your sleeping patterns. And I, I'm really intrigued by that data because it kind of tells you if you even should push that hard that day and kind of helps you separating feeling from, from reality. Like mm-hmm. we all are tired, you know, at some point, yeah. but like knowing that is not you being like lazy is your body that is telling you to take, you know, take a break. That is huge and data can help you distinguish between, you know, is I'm just like a bit sore or am I about to get injured? And then you can think about like all these like crazy, like interesting uh, problems of uh, actually looking at like bio biometric data, even deeper kind of like people that look at uh, like take blood tests and look at how their biochemistry is going. Or Mm -hmm. like I'm thinking about like um, going back to Michael Phelps, even even he leveraged, you know, science because like all this uh, speed suit that uh, made people much faster and much more hydrodynamic uh, were totally developed, you know, using mathematical models, like n- not the kind of math that I use on my daily uh, life, but like all this flight, dyna- flight dynamics, uh, finite elements, you know, work that kind of gives you the counterintuitive uh, discovery that uh, like, a, like a very, uh, I say like a very um, non-smooth surface is actually uh, allowing you to flow better with the water than a very smooth surface and kind of like uh, launch this uh, uh, generation of like shark skin type uh, uh, suits that, you know, make people glide like way more. So all these kind of things are 
have a huge potential. So uh, I'm really excited to see that there is way more like even user facing product that allow mm -hmm. for this type of data to be to be leveraged. Can you recommend a book on sort of data science or machine learning for the layman where like a book that a normal guy can read and understand what's data science, what's machine learning and how it's applied to the benefit of businesses in the modern world? Yeah, yeah, yes. So I have two. Uh, one is the one that I read recently, and uh, I really like the title, is uh, Weapons of Math Distraction. <laughs> and it kind of like ties back to what we were talking about, how big data doesn't solve every problem, but might actually make them worse. Uh, and it explains really neatly what data science is. And of course, shows a few horror stories of either good models to use for bad reasons or models that are they are flawed. And so kind of like gives you also an idea of how to build a good model to avoid those pitfalls. So that mm -hmm. one I really recommend and I've read it. The other one that I've not read, but I read a lot of things way more technical by this author is uh, The Book of Why by Judea Peril. And Judea Peril is the godfather of uh, causal inference. And uh, causal inference is, a, is a, a branch that I'm very, I use a lot in my work and uh, is one of my, my uh, kind of qualifications and things that I, you know, I, I do for work. And uh, the book of why is kind of like this explanation, very kind of layman explanation of causal inference, which I think is really interesting because it gives you that kind of thinking uh, that is very precious and is a this lens through which to see the world. Um, and uh, I haven't I read, as I said, I read his most his more technical books, and I talked to with a few people that read his uh, more kind of uh, um, open audience kind of book, and uh, they said awesome things. So I, I feel like I can recommend it without uh, being too worried about people not liking it. <laughs> awesome, awesome! Thank you so much. I, I'll make sure to put both books in the description of this video. Uh, Luca, it was a blast. Thank you so much for Same. taking the Thank time. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. This was Bye. a really fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.